Good afternoon. My name is Casey Keene. I'm the Director of Programs and Prevention here at the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to this webinar session entitled Our Gender Revolution, Social Change to End Gender Violence. This webinar is presented as a collaborative effort of the NRCDV's Domestic Violence Awareness Project and Prevent IPV Project. The National Resource Center on Domestic Violence is pleased to offer this webinar as part of our Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month initiative. This February, we're putting a spotlight on youth activism as an essential part of an effective movement to end gender-based violence. Youth activism has propelled social justice movements throughout history. And today, we're seeing youth taking on more issues than ever employing a variety of creative strategies to accomplish real change. Our intentional efforts to embrace intersectional approaches to our movement work will help us to create real social change together. Today's webinar will explore the Our Gender Revolution Youth Framework, uh, with, which it introduces concepts of gender, inequality, and a vision of the world to end oppression and violence that engages young people as social change agents. Presenters from the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence will introduce the 2017 We Choose All of Us campaign that directly addresses the current climate of hate and violence in our schools and communities as a model for promoting youth-driven activism for social transformation. As you see on this slide, Our Gender Revolution is featured as the Teen DV Month Tool of the Week on the PreventIPV.org website. So be sure to check that out. Um, you can download tools you, and you can learn more about um, them through our tools inventory on the Prevent IPV website. Now I am completely thrilled to welcome today's presenters. I'll tell you a little bit about them and then I will be passing them the floor and we'll get to hear from them. So Jennifer Martinez is a social change associate for the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence, where she began working in November of 2016. A first-generation Idahoan, Jennifer earned her undergraduate degree from Gonzaga, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, University in 2009, where she majored in political science and minored in Latin American studies. Following graduation, Jennifer worked for U.S. Senator Patty Murray as the Eastern Washington representative based out of Spokane. In 2012, Jennifer returned home to Idaho to work in the political arena where she held various roles. In 2015, she served as the organizing director for the Idaho Community Action Network. Most recently, Jennifer worked as a consultant for the Idaho Coalition and administrative assistant for the Upper Snake River Tribes Foundation. Jeff Matsushita, also a social change associate for the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence, is a father, partner, and believer in change. Since 2004, he's been a member of the Idaho Coalition's uh, team. The coalition has allowed Jeff to travel, listen, ask questions, and be part of the movement to end violence against women, girls, and gender nonconforming community members. In this time of movement, Jeff honors individual stories, the connection to one another, and a solid pickup game of basketball. Fantasy Bias is a 17-year-old junior at Capitol High, Capitol High School and an intern, a youth activist and organizer at the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. She was born in Utah and grew up in the heart of Boise, Idaho, creating relationships with peers, families, friends, and mentors. She is ending her junior year and beginning a, path to being more, beginning a path to being more involved in her school, community, future, and educating herself to bring awareness and appreciation to change. She keeps herself determined to be an advocate and ally throughout her experiences in life. The opportunities she has give her insight, motivation, and the youth-led power to be the best for the future. Last but certainly not least, we have Buki Ogan Renola, who is a student, athlete, and organizer at the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. As a student, Buki often finds herself learning more about herself, her community, and the ways that youth like her can become revolutionaries in movements where youth voices have been silenced. 
As an organizer, she commits herself to being an active force in places where one must speak up and speak loud in order to be heard. And as an athlete, she enjoys the clarity that a good game of 21 can bring the average basketball player. As a Nigerian immigrant, Buki plans to fight for any injustices that halt the progression of her or her people. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us today and for joining our conversation on our campaign that we have launched um, and are running here in Idaho called Our Gender Revolution. So um, here again, just uh, information on us, our names, um, and we also just wanted to make sure we mentioned that we are able to do this work through the OVW World Grant that we received. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Idaho, uh, most of the state is very rural, so a lot of the work we do takes place in those types of communities, um, with Boise being our only urban area, um, truly urban area throughout the state. So with that, we're just going to go ahead and uh, mention that we are going to be basing this conversation today on the Gender Revolution, Revolution Guide, um, Social Change to End Gender Revolution Guide. Um, we have developed this with youth voices at the center of the work that we're doing, and we encourage folks to download this um, and follow this guide um, to the best of your ability uh, with the full transparency that we are also constantly learning from our own um, learning opportunities, uh, learning edges, and uh, improving every day with the work that we do with youth here in our community. Um, another point of uh, information for the guide, our youth organizers were amazing and recorded podcasts to go along with the guide. Um, so when you download it, it will have places where you can click to get redirected to um, our YouTube channel and the youth voices are more present there. Um, so that is just some information for you. Um, so again, introduction for us. Uh, we're the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence, and we are um, doing work with youth um, here in our community to challenge the narrative and the reinforcement of gender norms, values, and the assumptions of power and powerlessness, and to organize for the evolution of gender norms, values, and shared power. We truly believe that in order to transform the way we think, the way our society and communities are structured, the way we live, and who, even who we are, we need to do um, the following, which is to speak to engage and activate youth from historically marginalized communities and leverage their leadership and innovation in every community. Um, youth are active and vibrant leaders and are often undervalued in the work that we do um, and often overlooked in the work that we do. So we have taken an approach of truly uh, bringing in those voices, especially from the historically marginalized communities in Idaho, which when most folks think of Idaho, they don't think there's a lot of diversity here, but we actually have a very, very fast-growing Latino population. We have two refugee resettlement centers here in Idaho, one in Boise and one in Twin Falls, Idaho. And we um, have a growing um, Asian Pacific Islander community as well. So we have a lot of diversity and we are truly working to center those communities in the work that we do with our youth leaders. Hey, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, this is Jeff Matsushita. Um, and as Jennifer had mentioned, um, with our diverse uh, state population, uh, as well of looking at the intersectional lens of how we're going to, as a state coalition, end gender violence. So we, we have been taking that at the center uh, of our youth work of intersectional lens, but we believe that gender is one uh, identity that links a lot of oppressions together. Um, as we talk about gender violence um, today, we'll kind of define it um, as a way of gender violence stems from reinforcement of gender no of social norms, excuse me, that pre-assigns the rigid gender roles and values and assumptions of power powerlessness, the tied to the idea of a gender binary. Um, we believe that this in turn perpetuates a climate of fear for cis and trans girls and women and people who challenge the socialized norms of heterosexual male dominance through their actions or simply because of who they are. We believe that the roots of gender violence and gender oppression are in patriarchy. 
And so together, uh, our collaborative or intergenerational collaborative has been making efforts and strides in moving forward to end gender violence in Idaho. Thanks, Jeff. So we're going to go ahead and uh, just provide some information on um, what youth are experiencing, uh, not only here in Idaho, but across the country as well. And youth experience gender violence at unacceptable rates, which is why we're centering a lot of our response and prevention work with our, our youth here in the state. Um, so youth from historically marginalized communities experience disproportionately higher rates of abuse and assault, which is why those voices are being centered in the work that we do. Um, Nearly one in 10 youth in the United States report physical violence from a dating partner, and one in 12 are forced to have sex against their will. Um, so that is something that we know is a reality that we have to um, work with and work through to um, prevent as much as possible. Um, a 2011 report from the U.S. Department of Justice the, um, and the Centers for Disease Control found that one in five women and nearly one in seven men who experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner first experienced this between the ages of 11 and 17 years old, which is why it's so crucial to do prevention work at a young age. Additionally, almost half of all female victims who have been raped experienced their first rape before the age of 18, 30% of that happening between the ages, again, of 11 and 17 years old. And these reports don't include sexual experiences that are due to coercion. Um, so those numbers for us are too high. <laughs> and so a lot of the work we're doing is not only on reducing those numbers, but really identifying the root causes that lead to these situations so that we can address that. And we'll I'll touch, we'll dive into that a little bit deeper in the conversation. Um, but with those numbers, those numbers are even higher for youth from um, historically marginalized communities. So um, in a 2013 study demonstrated that rates of domestic violence victimization among Latino adolescents was at 19.5%. And the CDC Youth Risk Behavior Survey reported that 19 to 29% of LGBTQ high school students experienced dating violence in the prior year, 14% to 31% of gay and lesbian students, and 17% to 32% of bisexual students were forced to have sexual intercourse. These rates are three times higher than the cumulative reports of all high school students reporting having experienced abuse or rape. So we know that this is happening. We know it's happening at higher rates for those um, from historically marginalized communities, uh, which is why we created this guide so that we can have these conversations about how do we truly engage youth in the work that we're doing. Um, and I know numbers are never fun to listen to, uh, but numbers are uh, unfortunately, what drives a lot of our work, so that's why we wanted to share some of those statistics with you. And I, uh, we are going to go ahead on to the next slide now, and Fantasy and Suki are going to be leading us. Hi, this is Fantasy. I'm sorry, I sound a little scratchy. I'm a little bit sick. But um, first, we want to talk about social change and what is social change and how is this approach from social change different than, I guess, regular? We want to keep intersectionality in mind most definitely. Social change, social change seeks to transform the underlying conditions that result in domination, extraction, and violence, to, and violence towards the vision of world rooted in interdependence, resilience, and sustainability, right? So we are all deeply interconnected as human beings. And any social change benefits all of us, absolutely, especially young people. Strong leaders and spiritual guides across many cultures have described our interconnectedness as a reason for doing the right thing and working for and towards change. It is though under, through understanding this interconnectedness that we can all be liberated, both the oppressed and the privileged. Hi, this is Buki. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the gender, um, how gender violence is not like individualized. Um, especially because of the fact that it results in systemic and societal conditions that perpetuate violence against cisgendered and transgendered girls and women and people who are gender nonconforming. Um, as a result, it's like our prevention stages need to expand beyond the individual and like relational levels and focus on community and societal levels that create these hierarchies um, when it comes to girls and women um, to reflect this deeper understanding. 
Um, so we need to address the root causes that contribute to this culture of domination and this culture of violence. And um, a broader approach addresses not just the individual behaviors, but also societal problems, um, individual levels, re relational levels, and within our communities and institutions. Okay, are you still with us? Yeah, okay. sorry. Um, and institutions no, throughout our society, um, through our influence in our relationship to these systems. Yeah, we want to talk about how gender violence is the result of systematic and societal conditions that actually perpetuate violence against cis and transgender girls and women and people who are gender nonconforming. And this is why our strategies must go beyond the individual and relational levels and must focus on community and our societal levels in order to create actual systematic change within our communities. Um, moving on with that, it, there's, we have to keep this idea of intersectionality in mind. Um, intersectionality is a framework that takes into account the multiple systemic oppression such as racism, sexism, ableism, classism, heterosexism, and many other forms of oppression um, and are connected to one each other. So it definitely deals with the fact that um, Problems are not single issue lives in that, or single issues um, cannot affect one aspect of an individual, but instead like, there are multiple issues that go into um, problems, societal problems, societal hierarchies. Um, again, one cannot look, examine one form of oppression without looking at the other, and they cannot be separated. Understanding that we are born as full is another framework that takes into account that identities and characteristics are used in our culture domination, extraction, and violence to erode wholeness and our humanities. And this is uh, Jennifer again. So intersectionality is such a crucial piece in the work that we do because uh, we truly believe in um, making sure that everyone's full lived experiences are present when we're talking about working to prevent gender violence. So for example, um, I'll take myself for example in this. I am a, a, cis, uh, a cisgendered woman who's also Latina, who's also uh, a first generation whose parents were undocumented and you know all of these different identities all are connected to each other in some way. So I can't talk about preventing gender violence without looking at all of the different experiences that I myself have had. So when we're working with youth and we are trying to do this, we also have to be intersectional in the way we approach it because of all of the lived experiences that our youth have had as well. Um, so that is why um, that's something that we truly believe is so crucial to the work that we do. And then the coalition has been doing youth engagement type of work um, since 2006. And when we first had our, our initial rollout of the work, um, it was very mainstream and, and was not representative of the entire state and, and everyone's lived experiences. Um, so we've reflected over the years of those first couple of years that we ran the campaigns, we actually put out uh, applications for around the state to have uh, up to 20 students guide our work and, and, and we called it a leadership committee, uh, and what we thought was really their voice were, in fact, we got some amazing resumes that came back to us, and we were very excited, and we brought these 20 youth down to Boise, and what we found is that they were very awesome. They had amazing credibilities, uh, outstanding GPAs, all kinds of community engagement work, that was very centric to the dominant culture, which in the state of Idaho was white, heterosexual, um, and Christian. Our early campaigns were much more on focused on the individual level about personal responsibilities and what we deserve as individuals around healthy relationship frameworks. Uh, and we do think that was good work at the time. And, and now as we've progressed, we realize that to truly represent the state of Idaho, we need to include the voices from our, our, our community members who are from refugees, our tribal communities in the state, and, and other community members from historically marginalized communities. So as an organization, we had to reflect on, on how we were representing youth voices and what work we were doing. And this has been a long 10-year journey for us, and we're still trying to make things happen. Um, and learn, and 
the two voices that we have today, both Fantasy and Buki, have been amazing guides in providing us with leadership and how this year's Our Gender Revolution campaign has rolled out and manifested. And the work that we do, it's not uh, easy. We definitely don't want to give the impression that it's easy. Um, the fact that we've been doing this for, for 10 years and we're still learning, I think, speaks to how messy sometimes the work can be and how uncomfortable it can be. But when we're creating social change, the work is going to be messy and uncomfortable. But when we come out on the other side of that, um, we, we're getting closer every single day to social change here in the state and across the country. And part of that is um, driven by the socio-ecological model. Um, so we, uh, like Jeff mentioned previously, a lot of the work that we've done in the past has focused on the individual and relational level um, of individuals. But we, in, in, in taking into account the full lived experience of young people in the state and of people in general, we also have to be aware of the community and the societal level of um, the socio-ecological model that impacts us as individuals. So those would be things like the social norms that we're expected to meet or behave in certain ways, and the larger societal institutions that perpetuate oppressions or perpetuate stereotypes as well. Um, so what a lot of the work that we're doing now for our gender revolution is focused on addressing those multiple systemic oppressions and understanding how those can impact greatly the experiences that young people are having in their lives and how that leads often to violence, um, gender violence. So um, we understand it's not a one-dimensional approach. It's, so it's, it's not a one-dimensional problem, so we cannot take a one-dimensional approach to it truly understand that that is something that we need to do. So uh, if what you'll see as we continue to move on through this is that the societal level and the community slash institutional level um, are where a lot of the root problems are occurring that lead to the situations where uh, individuals are in dangerous um, or precarious situations. So um, that is where we are focusing on, on addressing these changes. Um, and with that, we go into the first piece of when you're uh, trying to uh, really engage youth in the work that you're doing and in your organization, which is building an intergenerational collaborative. And Fantasy and Bruce are going to lead us through um, some of that. So starting off um, with a couple of social movements that um, youth have been the center of, um, one including uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, especially because um, the issue that Black Lives Matter highlights on affects uh, youth in disproportionately um, marginalized communities, um, the inner cities, places where the police presence is very high. Um, you have to look to the fact that um, youth stories are definitely highlighted and they are experts on their environments and their cultures. And, and because of that, they need to be in the forefront of these movements. Um, they need to be able to speak on them um, without feeling the need to validate themselves or their stories. Um, young people are the most creative, yet they are the most misunderstood and the vital voices and leaders in their social change work. Um, because of the fact that they are misunderstood, because of the fact that they are undervalued, um, it causes them to try to hide on the back front um, of these movements. Um, Black Lives Matter especially tries to keep young people, especially youth of color, at the forefront. Um, you see them on, on social media, you see them on the newscast. Um, um, being revolutionaries and following the steps of those who came before them. And when you give youth the ability to um, be that center, be that voice, it, it causes them to not only expand onto that specific um, issue, uh, that specific movement, the Black Lives Matter, but expand onto other movements, such as Standing Rock. Um, the youth voices behind Standing Rock is so um, apparent. You see them marching. You see them tweeting. You see them um, on social media. You see them um, finding ways that they could um, solve that or help that one movement. So um, when, essentially when you give uh, youth their voice, they're able to extend their voices onto um, other horizons and other, other issues as well. I absolutely agree with that, Buki. Adding on to that with your youth leadership being at the center of social change and just a recent um, social change slash, you know, march and rally that happened was a women's march. And I fortunately was uh, able to be a part of volunteering for the Women's March. And 
I cannot stress how important having that intergenerational collaborative was because not only did I have things to say, you know, and output to give, but also anyone younger than me or older than me was definitely able to speak their mind about how the march could have, could go and how, like, and their perspectives on, you know, what was happening with the Women's March and just all around the, even it happening, you know, and all around the other states. And I could just see the, the definite it, the generation just coming together, definitely youth and adults coming together, which I absolutely love to see. And that's what motivates me as a youth leader to create this social change is to see that every, most people working together, and as, as cliche as that sounds, it feels good, and that's how a community should feel. So with the Women's March and being able to volunteer, I got kind of like an insight and background on how to, how to lead and how to lead with my community and how to lead with adults. And so putting that on just felt really great. And then going through the march and just being uh, being a part of it, seeing uh, thousands of people there all wanting to be a part of it and just standing up for what they believe in really showed initiative and showed a great social change coming together with you being at the forefront, youth being there to support other youth or being there to support the, you know, the adults. And so I just thought that was that was really awesome and makes youth really feel great and I'm sure it could make the adults feel great being able to lead and mentor the youth and make sure that we all bring up that social change in the most positive way. So I'm just glad I was there at the Women's March. That's one of my main experiences, but I am so ready to get more involved being youth and being accepted by other people of my youth and adults to create the social change. <clears throat> And I, this is Jennifer again. I just wanted to point out that on this slide, the two um, young persons on the screen were actually the organizers of the Women's March here in Idaho in Boise. Um, they're high school students. They didn't see anyone taking the lead, so they jumped right in and, and started planning. And they had um, youth like Fantasy who were engaged right away who wanted to help. So the Women's March in Boise was definitely youth-driven with adults there as a support um, to help accomplish some of the more logistical things um, that were needed to happen, um, and we were able to provide resources to that. Um, and the other uh, organizing effort that's happening nationally right now that is totally driven by youth is the Dreamers um, movement as well. And if you're not familiar with Dreamers, they're undocumented students who came to this country at a very young age who want to continue going to school and want to go to college or want to go to technical um, school or learn a trade, and they can't because they have to pay the out-of-state or international rate for tuition because they're undocumented. And so there's an effort to have in-state tuition for undocumented students so they can continue to go to school um, and be able to afford to do that since they don't qualify for federal financial aid or most scholarships um, or grants for that matter. So that's something that has been going on for many years but has always been centered, by, centered on and run by undocumented youth. Um, so that's just another example of, of organizing happening um, here in the state and across the country as well and, and just highlight the great leadership that you bring to the movement. Um, so I'll stop talking there because I believe Fantasy and Buki have a little bit more to share with us. Yeah, thank you, Jen. No, I totally agree on that. And that just shows how youth are experts on their environment and their culture and how they're essential to developing relevant, engaging, and effective strategies within their community. Young people are the most creative and misunderstood and vital voices and leaders in social change and social work. Yeah, and going on to our next slide, which is youth leadership, um, we want to make sure that we know that passion is a vital key and a vital component in what, in what drives the youth. So we need to find leaders like youth and everyone can find leaders not only in school, but in the community to access the power of youth leaders. You should try to start by engaging youth from historically marginalized communities to be a part of an intergenerational collaborative, which may include racially and ethnicity diverse youth, Native American youth, LGBTQ youth, youth with disabilities, youth from marginalized regions, youth who are undocumented, and youth who are refugees, just getting a lot of those intersectionalities all into one and bringing those perspectives and those varieties and just reaching out as much as you can. Uh, thank you, Fantasy. Um, moving on for, or expanding on from that, um, you have to recruit youth that are passionate about impacting their peer groups. So in order to have um, 
youth that impact their communities in positive ways. You have to have youth who are opinion leaders within their school, their community, um, youth who are not who are not scared about um, being almost um, the leaders of um, harsh topics, talking about leading talk conversations on like difficult subjects, uh, making individuals uncomfortable because we live in an uncomfortable society and um, individuals must be challenged on their uh, ideals and um, the standpoints that they have currently. Um, also, you have to engage with youth leaders, building these partnerships requires active listening, um, meaningful relationship building. So these relationships need to move beyond the transactional partnerships and projects, so to say, and into connected ways of working with each other. So you have to take what you tell you and not just um, from the platform that they're telling you so you understand it, but instead take that, what they say, and expand more from that. Um, ask them how they can be a part of it. Ask them how you can be a helping hand, um, a supporting role in getting um, what they believe done. Um, also, build relationships among youth leaders across your school and community. Um, celebrate the, the diversity, the identities, and the histories of youth in your communities and from youth movements as well. Exchange skills and knowledge to increase the leadership and youth to lead a local change um, efforts in their communities. To add on to that, those are all great points, and I have some other points too, is to provide opportunities for youth to lead boldly and lead bold conversations and to build that youth power to create that safer space and also deepen young people's knowledge around advocacy as a strategy for systematic change and strengthen their skills when engaging in system, when engaging systems leaders and decision makers. Also shift the narrative of historically marginalized youth to view them as a positive asset and community leader and making them included and in just being inclusive and involved and in gaining that knowledge and that information to be an advocate. Because an intergenerational collaborative is so essential and so necessary, um, adult allies really need to understand that they need to create an environment that is conducive to helping youth find their voice, their passion, their leadership style. Um, they should be helping hands and helping roles and that way youth are able to um, feel like they are valued and they are respected and they are understood in situations where most of the time they aren't. Awesome. Thank you so much, Buki and Fantasy. Um, and leading off of that conversation about adults being allies, um, one of the things that we have um, really been focusing on is identifying adult role models and as mentors and as champions of youth as well. Um, so one of the things that here at the coalition um, has happened, actually, um, I was hired recently, so I'm very new to the staff, and um, I was one of new, hi uh, new hires who um, has, a, I'm, I'm a Latina, so that's my, my uh, background, my cultural experience, um, and that is something that has allowed me um, to connect with our youth organizers on a different level, even though we might not necessarily experience the same culture or experience the same things, uh, growing up as something Growing up as marginalized communities in Idaho is something that we have been able to connect on, um, and uh, being a little bit closer in age doesn't hurt either. Um, so uh, it's definitely something that has allowed me to connect more with youth, and um, hopefully you feel the same way as well. So I am also very transparent in everything that I do with them um, to avoid any miscommunication there as well. So identifying staff who can culturally identify with young people from those communities um, and identify young adults who can identify on those experiences as well is crucial to this work. And thank you, Jen. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Jen. I appreciate that. Um, expanding on what Jen was saying, um, expanding on the fact that she's a POC um, in a community where um, in Idaho, where you don't really see a lot of POC, especially like women of color being in places of power and position, um, high places, it's great to have mentors as a youth, especially it's great to see mentors um, that identify with some of the groups around you. Um, I know it's great seeing like Jennifer and our, one of the other um, leaders that we have, Estefania, um, being in places where um, us as youth can go to them and um, wonder how, like, how they made it, and they can mentor us and they can lead us um, through our lives as well. Um, so when building relationships with youth leaders, it's important, it's important to keep a few things um, in mind, one including um, the, impor the importance of transparency. Um, because of the fact that youth see adults as already as almost a 
an authority figure, um, there has to be a level of transparency between the youth um, and also the adults as well. Um, this allows them to be personalized, personal, or this personalizes the youth with the adult, um, and it creates a situation where both of them are, are able to understand each other. Um, it also allows them to show that they aren't perfect. Um, adults aren't perfect, youth aren't perfect. So why create a situation where you both are um, in a place where you believe that you can't mess up because um, they are the all they know the most or whatnot, but they don't because both are learning at the same time, the same speed. So there should there should be some sort of um, relationship built between them. Um, also, I find it incredibly important that um, youth feel understood, um, especially because youth go to school for more than six hours a day every day. There are situations where they aren't, um, their voices aren't being heard to their full capacity. So you must. Um, create that space where after school they feel like they're valued, they feel like they're understood, they can come and talk to you, um, and you can, they can see that you genuinely, um, they, you genuinely care about them as well. Um, I know that, um, uh, sorry, you know that um, gender-based violence does not affect youth, nor does it just affect adults, so it has to be intergenerational because gender-based violence is such an um, important um, issue in our lives. Um, it has to, you have to realize that both um, aspects of both the youth and the adult, um, um, at, or both the youth and the adult, uh, I can't find the word. I guess both the youth and the adult um, life, uh, situations in life and um, how they got to, how they were able to come um, I'm sorry, I'm just like rolling over my words. I'm uh, sorry. Gender-based violence does not affect just youth nor adults, so you have to realize that um, the single-issue lives aren't just affected towards youth nor just adults, and so you have to realize that there has to be communication between them because intergenerational um, problems cannot be solved by just one generation um, solving them because they affect uh, such a wide group of people. So you have to support them, earn respect through consistency, um, make sure that you support all their passions, and you explore and set community agreements as a group. Um, make sure that when youth enter a room, they, um, there's a set of guidelines that they know are going to be um, followed every single time they enter that room. And it allows them to like, speak their truths more and also make sure they modify, or you modify them according to which group of youth, of, the youth you are with. And um, also, make sure that you provide positive reinforcements. Um, do not just shut them down, especially because they are shut down a lot because they are young, they haven't experienced life yet, um, because they are so, um, quote, unquote, naive. Um, when it risks silencing the youth and when they, when they feel silenced, um, it creates a whole other barrier that needs to be knocked down. Um, make sure you avoid constantly saying no. Um, they hear no a lot. I know I do. Um, so... Um, by my parents, by other people. So if they're giving you solutions, um, don't just write them off, even though you truly believe that they are. Um, find a way to, um, they can make decisions for themselves. So find a way to like turn it to a place where they feel like their voice is still being heard, but you can also create um, better solutions as well. Um, so make sure you use positive reinforcement with appropriate, um, but also be direct in, in what they are doing well uh, true, as well. So make sure that you tell them that, um, they're still uh, they're still contributing whether or not um, they aren't because it creates it gives them um, the ability to think outside the box as well because they believe that um, their voices are being heard. So thanks, Buki. And I think um, with that part of it, it, it that is um, the appropriate feedback and direct feedback, um, you know, while, while there's still positive reinforcement, because we all know we have grant deliverables and deadlines and things we still have to meet because of our grants, so ensuring that we're very transparent about what exactly we need to accomplish because of the grant while also including the youth voices and um, making sure that we're, if, if something is um, not fitting well, that it's make clear why, right? Like the, a full explanation given on why something may or may not work. So, um, but definitely always encouraging them to continue thinking outside the box and giving us those ideas. So thank you so much, Buki. One piece for us as a staff that, that we've had to consider um, and be reflective upon is our own unconscious and implicit bias. Um, so I would in, invite you to maybe spend some time using Dr. Google search to look for Stanford University 
has um, some very free and available implicit bias tests that you can take. Um, they're anonymous and they're collecting data from around the country. So you'd be helping out a research project and having some introspection into your own um, implicit bias conditions that we, we have come up in being a part of our community. Um, yes, and I believe that we were going to launch a, a poll question here. I think this is the slide where we were going to ask um, if folks were comfortable um, sharing, you know, in this poll uh, when your last act of ageism might have been that you didn't even realize was an act of ageism, but um, maybe thinking back on it and, and realizing that that was something that happened. Um, so if you're comfortable answering the question, we'll kind of get a sense of that. Um, so thank you so much to our, our um, moderators who are helping us run this. And for clarification piece, for our definition of ageism is looking at talking with young folks, people that are younger than you or ourselves, and making statements that, and beliefs that they don't know what's about to happen or what's going on based on their age. For example, I found myself just two days ago at the high school where I coach boys basketball telling young men that they needed to tone down their, their music and be more focused because true champions get it done with their mind and not their words. And what I was really modeling to them was that they didn't know how to go out and compete. And so I was telling them through my own lens and experience of how they needed to operate. Um, so as a coach, that came with a lot of power, that I was putting them down based on their lack of limited experiences. And I believed in the moment that I was doing right, but still I was, I was uh, using my power to put them down and not give them their full range of abilities to grow. Thank you so much for that, Jeff. Um, so I, is this where we would see any results? Yes, thanks, Jennifer. We're going to share the results of the poll now. So thank you all for your, um, for your honest input to this polling question. So you can see here, it looks like 14% um, admitted to within you know, a couple days, 8% uh, admitted to about a week ago, 15% said a, a month ago, 6% uh, said within the last six months. So you can see kind of how that shakes out. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for, for putting yourself out there. We know it's not an easy thing to face, uh, but we definitely, if we're going to do the work, we, we, we need to be a, a little bit uncomfortable in facing those unconscious biases that we do have. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move along, and Fantasy, go ahead and start us off. All right, so a lot of that ties into what type of environment that we are looking for. And the next slide saying positive reinforcements and creating opportunities. So that environment, what we want to talk about is what it would look like. It's providing a safer space for youth to independently form and develop their ideas, priorities, and messages, and just creating that environment with the intergenerational collaborative and allow youth leaders to make choices in as many ways as possible, get that creative mind going and, and flowing. And also gives youth leaders more than one choice and be comfortable with each choice you provide and just letting them express themselves, accepting it, and just maybe going with it, but having that environment to where they can feel comfortable or having it safer and just more expressive so you can get more, more ideas and perspectives. As an organization, one of the choices we made, um, previously we had been paying stipends for, for our youth to come in and provide work. And instead, we, we believe that an hourly salary, salary is necess necessary. So we're actually making them part-time staff to, to value and reinforce what they are bringing to the organization as leaders and valuing their time as a part-time staff to see them as, as, as valued. If I could tie into that as well, um, what, they, what the coalition, I believe, does and what we want to see in an environment is to, to provide equitable support and resources based on their specific needs of the youth. Um, that are working for you. For example, offsetting transportation costs for youth for low-income households, providing child care for teen parents, just some of these ideas getting involved. And for many youth, young people, this may be their first exposure to increased consciousness of concepts like system, systemic sorry, and his, historical oppression and intersectionality. I definitely know uh, before coming into this work, I did not know what all these big and important words meant like intersectionality or oppression. And so just being aware and creating that environment to where 
I don't, I'm not looked down upon for not knowing these words, but creating an environment to where I feel comfortable and I feel more knowledgeable with the environment that they're giving me and the people who are expressing these, you know, these, this knowledge to me, it just feels really great, re- really great for a youth to, you know, have that increased knowledge and awareness. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Fantasy and Jeff. And uh, for the sake of full transparency, uh, we are running a little behind on our slides, so we're going to move through the next few slides a little bit more quickly so that we can really get to the meat of some of this discussion. Um, so uh, with regards to how to engage youth um, and how, where to provide opportunities for youth, we have the youth engagement continuum. Um, so our angle, obviously, is youth organizing, but there are various ways that we can work with youth to get them engaged. Um, so clearly youth services um, that programs can provide to ensure youth um, from historically marginalized communities, um, from rural areas, from our tribal communities are accessing services that are needed. Um, and that is something that is crucial, but also providing opportunities for youth development to happen. So how can we um, help uh, sharpen uh, leadership skills or other skills that are needed for youth leaders to be able to go into their schools or go into their communities to lead these conversations and create social change. And with that, um, it's youth leadership is tied directly into that. Um, and that often leads to youth civic engagement. So we have a lot of youth who get involved with um, civically oriented groups. Um, for example, we have the Future Hispanic Leaders of America, which works a lot with youth to ensure that they are um, not only developing leadership skills, but that they are going into their community and doing direct work there as well, which is uh, youth organizing at its core. So it envelops all of these different steps. Um, so just keep that in mind that although youth organizing is the end goal, there's all of these different ways, and the youth guide goes into more detail on all of those. Um, next. Uh, it's, also, it's also crucial to create a leadership pathway. Um, often when we engage youth, we, we forget about youth after like the age of 18 up until they're in their mid-20s um, to late-20s. And that's because there, there isn't a real way to keep youth engaged at that point. So by engaging them at a younger age, we're not only developing future leaders, we're also developing a pipeline of sorts for youth to continue to stay engaged and they know what organizations they can go to and they know where they can go to that is going to allow them to have difficult conversations. Uh, for example, when a lot of the things happening um, where certain communities are targeted, um, our youth know that they can come here and they can share how they're feeling and they can be vulnerable in this space because it's a safe space for them. And we are understanding of that and we allow them to share those feelings, whether it is sadness or anger, um, and it's our responsibility to provide that space and also to um, work with our youth organizers to ensure that those um, feelings don't envelop them either. How can we work through this together and how can we um, work through this to, towards the end of social change for our community? Um, so that is just a, a light touch on that, but moving on. Um, so in that same piece where we create a safer space uh, at, at our office and our gatherings and workshops, I um, want to invite you all to be aware and prepared um, to support the, the youth that you are engaging with. Oftentimes this may be the first exposure they have to definitions, our terminology that we have in our movement, um, to really put, put a, a, some facts or some credibility behind the experiences they've, they've had out in the world. Um, so being very transparent about mandatory reporting and your role as, a, as an adult and what mandatory reporting steps look like and the process it is. Um, not, to, not to silence the voice of any disclosures or things that may come up, but just to be transparent and inform uh, your youth about what, what needs would have to happen if they uh, share anything that would regard to the mandatory reporting laws in their state. Um, and as Jen kind of mentioned, a space to, to express yourself, whatever emotions may come. Um, and we see ourselves as mentors mm -hmm. in, in that piece, which starts walking the line of adultism at times. But as mentors, our role is to, to listen, to encourage their feelings, and help guide through some of those, those uh, emotions that may be destructive, such as anger and rage. Um, those move towards any physical or, or kind of community damage. We need to really bring that back. Uh, to be more 
communication through our words and our actions and just how we support our youth in their overall development as we go forward. So leading that directly uh, into adultism and power dynamics, um, you know, we mentioned that sometimes we're, we're on that line where it's what we're doing, being adultist or not. And when we say being adultist, it's, um, you know, are we uh, devaluing or not centering youth experiences because we think that we know more because we're older um, or we're telling them no because of whatever reason or we're not being fully transparent with what's going on or not giving them full information. Um, so we are always making sure that we're not only checking ourselves but that we're comfortable enough to um, call one another in as staff if we notice adultist behavior happening. And also our youth are very empowered to tell us that, um, if they think that we're being adultist. For example, one of, a perfect example of this is actually um, during this webinar, uh, we knew we wanted to do this and share you know, our, our experiences in working with youth organizing. And we didn't even consider the time of day that this was happening. And one of our youth organizers, you know, emailed us back and was like, hey, this is awesome. I really want to be a part of this. But can I ask why we're doing this at a time when we're all in school? And we were just like, yeah, definitely. Yes, we did not even think about that. Thank you so much for calling us in on that. Um, so we're constantly learning as well. And so to give you a more um, direct definition of what adultism is, it's the restricting, putting down, controlling, humiliating, or hurting uh, another that young people experience at the hands of adults. And it is the belief that um, adultism is considered the training ground for all oppressions, right? So if we're being as adults oppressive to youth already at this point, then all of these other oppressions are just going to uh, also uh, happen because youth have not been empowered to um, stand up or contradict these social norms. And I, we're going to go ahead and um, throughout the conversation share some examples of that. But I believe earlier we were talking about um, constantly saying no and not even being open to ideas from youth. That's a clear example of adultism. So just keep that in mind as you start to do this work. And don't be afraid of um, calling each other in to have those conversations and being responsive when someone is, like a young person is telling you um, that this is something that they're feeling as well. We're going to move into the, the second portion of the, the OGR facilitator's guide um, and talk about a little bit of how building the capacity um, within your organization to have a truly intergenerational collaborative and moving forward. We're kind of focused on these first two bullets, the uh, first one being create a shared purpose and vision of what you're working towards. Um, real plainly, if we don't know what we're working towards, we, we really don't know where we'll be when we need to be there. Um, so it's really important as a collective and intergenerational co collective moving forward to come together with a, a shared vision and purpose in what you are all working towards, to know also what you're working against. Um, and, and to get to that place along with the idea of safer spaces, it's, relationships are, are critical and, and should be put at the forefront. Uh, of any of these collaborators to get this started. Um, but these relationships take time and, and, and intentional efforts and activities going to, for everybody to put that trust in the space um, that you can build and enhance your relationship moving forward together. Awesome. And then one of the most important things as you're starting to create your collaborative, um, you know, who are you inviting to the table, inviting youth to the table, inviting youth from historically marginalized communities such as in Idaho we have um, a handful of tribes here, you know, we make sure that we're very inclusive of that. Um, we also have, like I said, undocumented population, refugee population, immigrant population. So being intentional about who's invited. Um, and, um, you know, schools are often invited as well, but we also know that it can be limiting sometimes to do work within the school environment, especially for us, our reality is working in Idaho. So what other organizations are already doing work with youth that we can engage in, the, in our collaborative? Um, but with, when you have identified those folks, what can you um, do together? And part of that is figuring out what you already know. That way you're not spending time recreating the wheel or um, you know, going down a road where someone's already been there and you can share that information and those resources at the very beginning. 
so that as a group you can focus on where are the gaps of where we need more knowledge and skills and focus on those areas so that we can continue to make the collaborative stronger and continue to build um, where we actually need to build. So that's something um, that is very important to, to be aware of as you start to do the work with your collaborative and the guide goes into way more detail with um, some of those things to look for um, as you um, start to build your collaborative. And with that, um, it's important to note that everyone learns differently, um, so it is very important to practice different learning styles um, in your collaborative and with your youth organizers as well. Um, so, you know, people learn visually um, or are spatial learners. Um, we have uh, people who learn better through um, auditory or music, verbal learners, physical learners, logistical learners social and solitary learners. So um, just be aware that, um, you know, uh, like webinars might not work for everyone, but how can we make sure that we're getting this information the best way possible to everyone in the collaborative and including all those different methods um, in the work that you're doing and in the skills that you're building. Um, so um, just be sure that you're considering that when you're working with youth and with your, with your collaborative as well. Um, so we're now jumping into step three, which is the, a lot of the meat of this discussion. Um, and if you have questions at any time, just please feel free to type them in and, and we'll get to those. Um, but designing and activating those actual social change strategies. Um, so the first piece is comprehensive strategies. Um, so we talked about the socio-ecological model. Um, and so a lot of the strategies focus on those different levels of the model, so the societal level, the community level, the relational level, and the individual level. So by in, you want to create a strategy that is comprehensive and operates on all levels. Um, just like we talked about with intersectionality, you can't only work on one thing because of our whole lived experience. We have to include everyone's um, identities and everyone's experiences. So it goes with the socio-ecological model where we have to do work on every single level in order to really enact and create the social change that we're working towards, which is preventing gender violence. Um, so with that, um, what would things look like at the societal level? Those are things that happen on a broader societal spectrum, such as civic engagement and youth organizing work. Um, at the community level, it is where you're strengthening your neighborhood or your community settings, such as schools, and developing processes and pro policies that promote those healthy constructs of gender and anti-oppression framework. Um, so that is where, why uh, we were talking about the, gender, the youth um, cont engagement continuum. That's why those leadership and development pieces are so important so that they can go into the community and do that work. Um, relational level strategies could look something like um, work that impacts um, the individual parents or caregivers, their fellow peers in whatever setting that may be, whether it's a school or hanging out with friends or uh, the YMCA, whatever that looks like, um, and other uh, personal, interpersonal connections and relationships that they are experiencing, and the individual level as well. So uh, making sure we're working to, um, like we do workshops, OGR workshops, where we um, start to challenge some of those norms and merely have folks think about why do I have these constructs in my mind of what gender looks like and how can I challenge that. Um, and for us, we have really um, gotten to the point where we're focusing at the societal and community level of strategy, even though we still do work at the relational and individual level, um, because we feel like the societal and community level are the best and highest use of our time. So we're moving beyond those other two levels to where the root problems um, often exist that perpetuate these, um, this gender violence and also gender um, norms uh, and uh, we definitely, like Jeff mentioned way earlier, we started out doing a lot of this with a healthy relationship focus, but often that can feel like or, you know, feedback we've gotten is that it feels like it shifts the burden to the individuals rather than the greater societal um, things that are happening that are allowing these oppressions to continue that cause experiences in an individual's life that has now put them in a situation where they're experiencing uh, a gender of violence. So how can we even prevent some of these experiences from happening? And that's where a lot of the societal and community level work happens. 
And some of these things that people are experiencing are things like sexism and misogyny and racism and other violence that has happened in their lives, which is going to uh, often allow for a situation of gender violence to occur. Um, so we're just taking all of that, the context of someone's whole lived experience into account, which is why those two societal and community levels are where a lot of our focus is at the moment. And in trying to, to be mindful of reaching those outer layers of the ecological model, um, we mentioned earlier about our vision, but we encourage you and invite you to, to form a bold vision uh, as your collaborative goes forward. Um, and, and the idea of some of the questions that, that we at the Idaho Coalition have been undergoing for the last year and a half almost. Um, so we've been willing to invest the time and resources in, into looking at what, what is the world that we want to create and what pathways and strategies for our work will get us closer to that direction. Um, we've asked ourselves questions like, you know, what kind of world do we envision? And what is our purpose or distinct role and services of this vision as a collaborator moving forward? Um, and does our vision incorporate and uh, keep social equity for all people? Um, so very plainly, our, collective, our bold vision of the Idaho Coalition is collective liberation and social equity for all. Um, and to get there, we are guided by our North Star, which is really the liberation um, for the person with least or the last girl. Um, in our state of Idaho. So all this feeds into that bold vision of where we need to be going as a society and as a community in all the intergenerational work that we have going forward. So one of the um, levels that we talked about that we're doing a lot of work in is societal level strategies, which, as we mentioned, was challenging and changing societal norms, values, and assumptions of power and powerlessness that create a culture of domination, extraction, and violence that we are working to change. Um, so with that, um, what would that look like? What kind of strategies would this include? So this can include um, youth organizing, as we mentioned, to um, alter those power relationships, which is why we are so cautious of checking our own adultist, maybe adultist tendencies, um, or any other unconscious biases that we have so that we can create truly meaningful change, um, promoting campaigns to change social norms, and, and the way that people think about gender roles and or value-based campaigns that promote equity, liberation, and other values um, to uh, create a world that is interdependent, resilient, sustainable. Um, so, for example, our, our, our gender revolution campaign, so we have the guide, but we also have a poster campaign where we just got done about a week ago sending um, posters and materials to every single high school and middle school across the state. And that was a huge endeavor, um, and it took a lot of time, but it is something that we feel is so worth doing, especially in a state like Idaho where it's very rural, and it, access to resources is not always easy, or uh, access to get something like that would require a one hour or three hour or five hour drive. Um, so we took it upon ourselves to send all of this, and we have done it for many years now where we send the information directly to the high school, and we follow up with phone calls to ensure that they got it and do they need more, do they have questions, so that um, we can start to um, make sure that we're changing um, the or challenging these gender norms as much as we can. And sometimes we do get pushed back from school, um, but you know, uh, we feel that it's, it's important to, to do the work that we're doing. Um, and all of this, as you know, goes through a process of our, our youth, you know, contribute to it and staff contributes to it. And then we have, um, you know, a consultant to look at it, and then they go through the OBW app process. So there's all these levels of things it goes through. Um, and if we need to have a conversation with a school that might not understand exactly what we're doing, we do that. So it's a lot of relationship building as well on top of making sure those resources are available. Um, and our end goal is ensuring that we're creating an environment for youth to strive. So it's not just about reducing those percentages of youth who are engaging or experiencing gender violence or reducing those negative statistics we talked about earlier, but truly creating a world where all, of, all youth can thrive, and that is creating um, societal level changes. And one of those strategies that, that we actually have been fortunate enough to have Jen join our staff is around the idea of youth organizing. Um, in the past, the coalition has really focused more on the idea of primary prevention, 
which lent us down more that individual and the relationship level on the ecological model for all the strategies and engagement that we did around the state with our youth. Um, so for us, this is a new practice uh, of youth organizing and, what, and the powers that organizing has uh, and the ability to make social change um, throughout our state and rippling effect out in the upper levels of the ecological model to sustain the change and so that every, ensuring that our bold vision comes true and we're able to move forward and everybody is equitable um, and safe. Definitely. Um, and by bringing um, our youth organizers into an intergenerational model, we're allowing their leadership to be harnessed and implemented. So we've already seen that youth have like this great power, so we're just doing whatever we can to help that grow um, and work intergenerationally. So, um, so with that, I'm going to go on to the next slide. And I just want to point out that all of the youth here are on, on the slides are youth from Idaho who are engaged in some way in their community or their schools already. Um, some are our youth organizers. Some are youth who are involved in social justice clubs on campus or who just um, are friends with some of these folks and really wanted to be engaged. So they showed up um, and are involved in their community somehow. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, so youth organizing at the, at the societal level impact. Um, so this um, creates the ability for youth civic engagement to occur and um, to be able to promote values such as wholeness and to do anti-oppression work. So some of that, what that looks like is um, being able to confront racism and discrimination and its role in creating that disproportionate impact on people uh, of color and women of color, girls of color, gender non-conforming people of color, uh, because we know that they're experiencing gender violence at higher rates, so that's a piece of that work. Um, also connecting youth issues to broader community issues. Um, often when you see youth work happening, um, it's isolated or in a silo that youth work is youth work and it doesn't impact all this other stuff, but in reality youth are impacted by everything that we as adults are deciding on, whether it's policy or legislation or whatever it is. So um, making sure that that connection is made, that youth issues are not living or in isolation, but are truly interconnected to all of the other things happening in our world and community. Um, and through youth organizing, young people can build and exercise their individual and collective leadership. So that's something that we've definitely seen with our youth organizers, and it's awesome to see not just the work they're doing collectively here at the coalition, but the work that they are doing and leadership that they're providing in their schools and in their community. Um, it's truly wonderful to see that. Um, strengthening self-confidence and developing tangible skills that they can use, not just in youth organizing, but that translate to other work that they're doing in school or as they continue on after high school into the world, um, things that really are available for them. Um, developing an understanding of how to navigate like political processes and systems that often is where the decisions are made that impact you know, uh, what's happening in their schools and in their communities. Um, and really providing just agency for, for youth to um, live into their full capacity and provide as much support as we can so that, um, you know, because we, we're not going to be around to do the work forever, and we have to be able to release some of that power to empower our youth as well. And picking up at that community level, uh, from the community level impact on the, on the ecological model, uh, we've been beneficial of just we're benefiting from just asking youth in, in neighborhoods and communities of where do they go after school or before school, where do they get meals, where do they hang out, what are stores they get at um, and share time at because those organizations, those community-based organizations and, and markets and stores have been good partners for us to display some of the social change poster campaigns and stickers that we've been able to produce um, and get out. So we've We've benefited by having our youth and, and share their, their experiences with us. And so at that community level, we've been able to get beyond just schools but more into the neighborhoods to help improve and, and affect that social climate um, and, and have conversations with businesses to look at some of their hiring policies um, that can maybe make it more friendly to hire some of the youth from that community to be employed and be um, members of their, of their workforce. 
And along with that, um, like there are some practical procedures when it comes to youth organizing. Um, so there are some questions that we, um, we consider and that we would encourage all of you to consider as well when you're starting to do um, this type of work, um, if this is the path you choose to go on, um, is um, which group agreements will you incorporate to reflect, respect, and support um, an effective and collaborative learning environment, you know, so taking a look at, you know, can you come up with community and or group agreements to allow that environment to be cultivated? Um, how might respect be addressed with respect, uh, expressed by youth um, with various cultural values, um, you know, taking their full lived experience into account, and how do you create agreements around that? Um, you know, what unintended consequences and additional pressures might arise when creating um, blueprints to create change um, within the community? And I believe we had an example um, of that. Uh, so, um, sorry, I can't read my own handwriting right now. So, <laughs> it would be that example was actually based kind of in my air. We were uh, looking at doing a new project and engaging particularly young men from a specific community, um, and we've been investing time and in our, our knowledge of, and years of experience. And what we realized very late in the process was that we didn't have any young men from that community informing us, guiding us, and providing their, their realities with, of what the, what the realities are. So our project, in a sense, was very hollow um, based on our own adult view and not from anything from the leadership and the expertise of these young men who are on the ground living in their world on the daily. Um, so that's just one of the pieces that we have continued to, to need to be um, aware of and we're moving forward with engaging our youth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe even a simpler example is making sure that we host our meetings at times when they're available, outside of school or jobs that may occur. Mm -hmm. And when we do gather, we, we always make sure we have food. Yes. And it may be the Japanese um, heritage in me, but I want to make sure everybody's walking away with, with extra food to go back to, where the, to make sure they have breakfast or lunch for the next day. Mm -hmm. So um, just those times of when we gather and having food present from when we do gather um, not only shows to me a sign of respect for the expertise that we're garnering and getting, but also provides that relationship to go back and forth that I'm more comfortable sharing ideas and everything else when I have a full belly. So it's always a good thing. <laughs> Um, so youth organizing um, with the relational and individual level impact. Um, so this goes back to um, you know strengthening those relationships, those interpersonal relationships with parents or other adult influencers, um, developing um, and uh, strengthening bystander skills and behaviors, and also uh, strengthening middle and high school um, youth engagement. So whatever um, that might look like to interrupt gender violence. Um, by valuing cis and trans girls and women and people who are gender nonconforming, um, increasing knowledge, attitudes, and skills for healthy social constructs of a whole gender, um, and social and emotional learning skills with a gender analysis, bystander skills, as well as anti-oppression knowledge, and skills to interrupt our culture of systemic oppression, domination, extraction, and violence. Um, so that might look like building that, co that collaboration and cohesion among youth and adults, that intergenerational partnership, building um, collective purpose among youth and adults, um, and just uh, being able to create this intergenerational community that we um, are talking about. Um, and part of that is the social norms campaign and social activism. So, and, and the ideas of that, that norms work, um, we started just talking about gender violence, and, and make that point again, that gender violence intersects with so many other systemic oppressions that we need to take that integrated approach and perspective so when it comes to making any real and concrete social change in our community. Um, so we, we want to be able to do positive social norm campaigns um, as a strategy to increase and create the new social norms that we want to fill the void with. So we can talk a lot about framing the problem. And if we see that problem as a vortex, what are we filling in and how are we making that change of what we're working towards, which brings us back to our bold vision. Um, we also know that we realize, as Jen said, we're we're tutoring and mentoring these next generation of leaders and people to take on this social justice work that we are in now. Um, and in building up their skills, we also need to inform them and let them realize that social norms change is slow um, and an ongoing process, but we know that we can achieve it because and these changes would be monumentally impactful. 
Um, so when the, this, the positive social norms campaigns that we've produced, um, we're engaging youth not only in the schools but also in the community. Um, we're specific to, to engage individuals at our workshops and invite folks to workshops and, and focus grouping that have a lot of social capital and have the, the influence to use their, their social influence to, to change those social norms through their language, through their actions and beliefs on the individual level, but that helps impact the relational level, which then carries over into that next level of the ecological model, um, and, and making that change um, very concrete in the social norms. Uh, so sometimes that, that rolls out also with making sure that we're um, really empowering the young people that are involved um, in not only the development but the leadership and their, their ideas as the campaign is enrolled out um, and keeping youth you know, initiated and, and developing the messaging, the imaging, um, and all the photos. Um, and with all of our slides, Jen mentioned these are our youth who are from our community that are on the posters, but even things like the text and the, the lines, the, the stripes in the background, um, we were informed that that feels like it's a, a shining out and breaking out of, of old change and, and, and hopes for new. So mm -hmm. I clearly glazed over those and saw them as lines, <laughs> but um, for our experts and our youth, they saw them as very symbolic in, in how this campaign can be rolled out. Yeah, they were very instrumental in giving us feedback on um, what even the look of the campaign is and the feel of it is. So um, all of this is centered on and driven by our, our youth organizers and youth that are engaged in our network here um, at the coalition. And that's because we truly believe that it needs to be youth-led. Um, so, you know, we actively engage them in every single way in every possible manner that we can. Um, and realizing also that with the social norm campaigns that we're, we're leading um, need to resonate with your youth organizers, um, you know, and members of your school and um, community, um, and collaborating or identifying organizations that you can collaborate with that have already established ties with the community. Um, you know, you don't want to um, step into something when there's already an organization doing that work when the most efficient thing you can do is to start to build that relationship with that other organization or those community leaders who are already tied so that you can move a little bit more quickly through an already kind of slow process of creating social change. Um, and it's a really great way to share leadership, to show partnership um, and how that can look like to your youth organizers and effectively target the communities that you're working with. And um, some, I mentioned that I'm super proud of the work that our organizers are doing, and I want to pass it back to them right now to provide some examples of organizing that they're doing, um, not necessarily here at the coalition, but they're do, that they're doing maybe in their schools or community um, that is, you know, driven and by and supported by all of us here. So uh, Fantasy or Buki, whoever wants to hop on first, I'm going to, you know, uh, send it back to you so that you can give us some examples of the awesome work you're doing. Thank you, Jen. I think I'm going to hop on this this example kind of like topic, giving you an example just because this, this means so much to me to either progress or disrupt these social norms as social activism. And I try to be an advocate and an activist as much as I can. And just um, recently and actually in progress right now, I go to Capitol High School in Boise. Um, I am creating and bringing awareness to a project called Gender Equity. So what I talk about and what I express is the social norms of gender and disrupting those norms and that male and female, that binary, and giving you know, more information and awareness to gender equity and norms and identities and all of that. And then also maybe even implementing a gender neutral bathroom and all gender bathrooms within my school. We have a, a, a numerous amount of bathrooms here at my high school and so I want to see if we can become more inclusive, more progressive, and just create that safer space for the LGBTQ communities or gender nonconforming, anybody who feels welcome in an all-gendered bathroom. So that's, a, just a, that's just a community and kind of like a school project that I have been working on and pushing towards. I talked with my, had the intergenerational collaborative and talked with my administrators, and I will probably end up going to the district, you know, to talk with more adults and, and parents and just getting my community involved and getting surveys and just as much information as I can out there to the, the people of my school to see how that resonates with them and just let them know just 
um, the future and what's coming and all of its content. And, and like in this slide, just talking about social norms, um, gender has been a very, a very hot topic and a very crucial one um, within, within my project. And so that's just one of the, one of the projects that I'm trying to do to just uplift my school and my community, which I'm really proud of. And I just want to get as much, as much a community involvement as, as I can as a youth, from youth and from adults. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, thank of you, course. Um, oh. No, good. Go back to you. So go for it, Buki. Oh, cool. Uh, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Fantasy, as well. Um, totally, I believe, um, besides working with the coalition, um, I also am, like Fantasy, I'm a debater um, at my school. So with that, um, I take every instance that I can in, um, I guess, in that space mm -hmm. to, especially speech and debate, we are talking about several different topics and ways that we can create solutions. Um, so I remember one in particular, um, it was approximately like a year ago where um, at one of our debate tournaments, uh, this was during the time of the very, very big, um, what happened with um, the young girl who was thrown across a classroom and by her safety school officer, and that was a really big situation and incident. Um, I remember the coalition right away. Um, they called the youth and were just like, "What can we do to support you?" And we were giving up idea, or we were giving some ideas, and one included creating creating a button that said um, "Black Girls Matter." Um, I definitely resonated with that button in particular because I am a black female, and so I believe. Uh, I took that button and I ran with it. Um, I took it to, I wore that button everywhere I went, um, especially to my debate tournaments. Um, sooner or later, individuals were asking me where I got it, um, if they can have one. And so I remember one day, um, I took like a whole bag of them to one of my tournaments and I had, I gave them to specific individuals and I, people asked me and I gave it to them. And before you knew it, you had um, the widest and the most like, um, just out of nowhere, like the people who are the most you could identify as, uh, I guess, the top of the hierarchy, wearing these Black Girls Matter pins, understanding the struggles of um, POC in America. And it was beautiful because, like, you saw them wearing them to their rounds, and you had people asking, and you had individuals. Like, it became this movement of just um, educating each other on these specific issues that involve or that, that target my, um, minority communities. And I felt um, incredibly, like, I felt empowerful because of the fact that um, I was so, I realized the power of youth and how much you can just, if you let us connect, um, there's so much that can be done. Um, there's a lot of initiatives that can be taken. And the fact that the coalition provided me with those buttons to create that spark that um, allowed us youth to come together and talk and um, understand each other and um, I guess, uh, create a community where I, I, could felt, I could feel myself being valued by my peers, and especially in a situation where there was a very um, hostile, I guess, it was very hostile the situation in that context because um, you had a lot of situations involving Black Lives Matter going around, and a lot of people were getting the bad um, connotation of the movement. Um, it, felt, it made me feel amazing to be able to correct um, the false narrative behind that movement, and the fact that the coalition provided me those resources made it even better because I felt like they made me feel like I was valued. And then I went to a space where um, uh, usually I'm, I don't feel so valued, and it was even then, like, I felt even more valued, and it was amazing. Awesome. Thanks so much, Buki, for sharing that. Um, as you can see, our youth are super engaged in their community already, so um, it's just amazing to see the change they're already creating. So I'm just going to move to these next pictures really quickly. So these, again, are the two um, youth organizers that we had who led the Women's March here in Boise. Um, and we, our youth organizers were also super integral in that. Um, we also have here um, Ty Simpson. She um, is a member of one of our tribes here in Idaho, um, and she drove down specifically to provide the opening invocation for this because um, Boise is located on ancestral native land and we felt it was so important to ensure that that was centered in, um, in this piece in the march. Um, just our staff being in the snow um, and Buki actually introduced Roxanne Gay. Um, she's written a book like Bad Feminist. Um, she was here and Kelly was actually the one, our executive director was the one who was asked to introduce her and Kelly, um, you know, made a point of giving up that 
position of power, so to empower Buki, empower our youth to be able to take that role on. So that's something that we need to be very conscious of. Um, we did a free Brescia Meadows uh, campaign that uh, was a day of action. And as you can see, we had youth um, from all over Boise come together, and they did some. Uh, they uh, drew a mural for her on in our parking lot. So that was amazing to see them come together for that. Uh, we had Lynn Rosenthal here, the first White House advisor on the Office of Violence Against Women. Um, and our youth organizers here were able to meet her, and we really just wanted to provide those opportunities for our youth organizers. And we had Gloria Steinem here. And, um, you know, we could have taken board members to this event, and instead Kelly ensured that we were focusing on and centering young people and young women of color to come and meet Gloria Steinem. Um, it's so important that we do that. And, um, you know, we were present at our Black Lives Matter rally and ensuring that, you know, they know that we stand with them. And with the, our campaign, our poster campaign, we intentionally overrepresented, um, you know, uh, girls, um, young women, uh, people who are um, from different ethnicities and races. And, uh, you know, we centered also on a member of our uh, of Muslim youth that we have active here at the coalition because of all of the anti-Muslim sentiment going on. And there's a uh, idea that uh, rural Idaho, rural America is white, but really it's not. Um, there's so much diversity there as well, so we made a conscious decision to overrepresent on young women, young girls, young gender nonconforming um, uh, communities in all of our work that we do. Um, so you can get all of this on our website. Um, and this happened, this picture is from us practicing self-care and um, physical practice on November 8th. We all needed a safe space to kind of talk, and we did it. And taking care of ourselves, um, that is something that we just have to do as we continue to do this work. Um, and with that, I don't think there's a lot of time for questions. We really pushed through that, so I apologize for the time that we took. But if there are questions, uh, please feel free to ask some of us now, and we also have our contact information up there. So uh, with that, I'll leave it open. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and I am so glad that you used every possible minute. Um, people have been very active in the text chat, and Kelly Miller has been very quietly and thoughtfully responding to the excellent questions um, that have been posed, so I want to thank Kelly um, for doing that. I am so grateful to all of our presenters today just for sharing so openly and honestly um, about your amazing work. So I want to thank you, Jennifer and Jeff and Fantasy and Buki. Um, you, you're, you're just an inspiration to all of us. Um, as participants in today's session, I want to remind you that you all will receive a follow-up email with the text chat so you can have you know, the, um, the resources that have been offered there and the advice. You'll also receive the recording and some attachments, um, some of the resources from the Our Gender Revolution initiative and from the We Choose All of Us campaign. You'll also receive the closed captioning transcript I do want to offer a very special thanks to our captioner for helping to create a more accessible learning experience for us this afternoon. She's had quite a job keeping up with all of us. I do want to also thank the NRCDV staff who have been working behind the scenes to bring you this session. So thank you, Yvonne, Justine, Patty, and Brecken. We encourage all of you to continue to learn with us and engage with us throughout Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month. Our hashtag ThisIsDV campaign elevates the voices of young people who experience uh, dating violence to help shed light on its dynamics and to offer resources to learn more. So thank you for your active participation today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And have a great afternoon. Let's keep the conversation going.